The Sabbath points to the, the rest, the rest that is given in Jesus Christ. That, that the, 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 the seventh day rest of God points to Jesus himself. And of course, we could look at this in the other gospels. We didn't, didn't we? Jesus says, come to me, all those who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Very next two stories in Matthew are about what? The Sabbath. <laughs> Jesus is the true Sabbath. Jesus is the true rest. If you're reading the Old Testament rightly, the temple points to Jesus. The Sabbath points to Jesus. The Sabbath, the Sabbath is passed away. We're not under the Sabbath anymore. Uh, Paul makes it very clear, doesn't he? You can rest on the Sabbath if you want to, but it's no longer required because the Sabbath rest is in Jesus Christ, and we think of that in Hebrews as well. Well, that's very clear in, in, in John. Jesus is the true manna. Jesus is the true bread of heaven. What's the true bread of heaven? They say, you know, give us lunch and dinner every day in John 6 like they had in the wilderness. And Jesus said, I'm your lunch and dinner. <laughs> the true food is me. It isn't, it, isn't, it isn't the physical food. It's the spiritual food. Jesus fulfills the Feast of Tabernacles, chapter 7, really 8 and 9, where you know uh, they have a water pouring right and a light right, practiced at the Feast of Tabernacles. And Jesus says, I'm the living water, right? I'm, and, and I'm the light of the world. In the Old Testament, Israel is God's vineyard, God's people. Jesus says, I'm the true vine. I'm the true Israel. So we already saw that in the Gospels, right? Jesus is the true Son of God. Jesus is the true Israel. Jesus is the true vine. He's the true Sabbath. The people of God, the Son of God, the king, it all, it all points to Jesus, doesn't it, finally? We're, we're, just, we're just using the categories in doing biblical theology. We're using the categories the authors themselves give us. And so, as you read, you want to see, don't you? You want to see what John himself is doing with the Old Testament, how he applies it. And, uh, yeah, we're not so surprised it refers to Jesus. Jesus is the good shepherd. John is very strong on divine sovereignty, very strong on predestination and divine sovereignty. New life comes from God himself. We won't look at all of these. Let's just look at John 6. Jesus said to them, I'm the bread of life. I'm the true manna. Whoever comes to me, ah, that's part of what it means to believe, right? Coming. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. You'll satisfy your spiritual hunger and your spiritual thirst, when you, when you come to Jesus and you believe in Jesus. Coming and believing are synonyms, aren't they? Two different ways, that's not the best way to put it. Two complementary ways of describing the, best, the same reality. Two verses later, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. All that the Father gives to the Son will come to the Son. So I can paraphrase this. All that the Father gives to the Son will believe in the Son, right? All that the Father gives me will believe in me or come to me. And whoever comes to me, I'll never cast out. That is, the one who comes to me will never be lost. And he says, I'll raise him up on the last day. Another problem with Boltmann's view of... Uh, no future eschatology. But by the way, what does Boltman do? He says, yes, those are all later glosses. <laughs> Can't lose, right? Can't lose, you know? It says there's going to be a resurrection on the last day. No, 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 that's not authentic. So um, nice try. Doesn't work, does it? So all those and only those given by the Father to the Son believe in Jesus, and come to Jesus. That's not everybody, is it? Years ago, I taught a very uh, small class at Bethel Seminary. Maybe there were 10 students in it, maybe 15. On the Gospel of John, it was a Greek exegesis class, and I had a very bright Arminian student in it from Gordon Conwell who'd come to Bethel, and uh, he was a great guy, and I, very sharp. So when we came to this verse, 
You know, it was a very interesting class because it was small enough we had a lot of dialogue and he just objected all the way through to my predestinarian readings. And he said, that verse refers to provenient grace in the Wesleyan sense. And I said, okay. Everyone to whom God has given provenient grace believes. So everybody believes. And he said, no, that can't be right. He was too good of an evangelical to say that, right? He goes, no, 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 that's, right. that's not right. So I said, what does it mean? He said, I don't know. I don't know what this verse means. But, he said, I know you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's where our conversation ended. I was pretty happy. Okay, you have no answer for this verse. You can say I'm wrong. I didn't want to grind his face in the dirt, you know? <laughs> you have no interpretation of this verse. It just doesn't work, right? It's clear. It is clear. This is effectual calling, isn't it? Those who are effectually called by the Father, are given to the Son, and they will believe. And if you're not affectionately called, you can't believe. Jesus said, don't grumble. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. If you're not drawn, and he doesn't draw everybody, you won't come. And I'll raise him up on the last day. So it's very clear. By the way, Isaiah 54, 13 is a new covenant promise. All your children will be taught by the Lord, Isaiah says. And that means only the elect children. <laughs> this, is, this is new covenant teaching where the law is put on your heart. So she has, yes, sir, John is very predestinarian. By the way, some people try to contest that reading by reading in John 12, 32, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And they say, see, the drawing is a drawing to all people without exception. But look at the context of John 12. That's where the Greeks say, we want to see Jesus. Do you remember that? We want to see Jesus. They say that to Philip. Philip tells Andrew, and uh, they go up and tell Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Just perfect, you know, just great. Hey, Jesus, these Greeks want to see you. And Jesus says, you know, a grain of wheat has to fall on the ground and die. Hello? Did you answer a question? Jesus goes off on a grain of wheat. We asked you, but... If it doesn't die, if, without death, it, uh, it doesn't bear much fruit. Well, he does answer the question, right? They want to see me, I need to die. How am I going to bring the Greeks to myself? How am I going to draw them when I'm lifted up? They want to see me, Jesus answers, they're going to see me through the cross and the resurrection, finally. So Jesus does answer the question. So verse 32 means, in context, I'm going to draw all people without distinction, Jews and Gentiles. Not everyone, not every individual without exception. I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. I'll bring them in. That's the Gentiles, right? I'm bringing them in. They will listen to my voice. Not maybe. Yes, they will. So very, very predestinary. And we could look at other verses. But we won't. Jesus' hour we see that Jesus' hour is the hour of his death. We don't need to talk about that, other expressions of his death. John, John emphasizes, as does Luke, but in a different way, the Holy Spirit, doesn't he? The Spirit descending upon Jesus, the Father and the Son giving the Spirit, the new life in the Spirit, and the paraclete. The paraclete's a very interesting thing. The paraclete, um, the paraclete theme is... Uh, how, how do you define the word paraclete? And I agree with those who say the best way to define it is not by looking at the word, but by looking at the context. So the paraclete is, uh, he's personal. Is he a comforter? Yes. He abides with you. Is he a teacher? Yes. He teaches and brings things to your remembrance. He, he is he, a, is he a prosecuting attorney? Do you know these views, that the paraclete's a comforter? But he's that, yes. Is he a teacher? Yes. Is he a prosecuting attorney? Yes, he'll testify. He's, he's an advocate, a legal advocate. He'll convict the world. There's the prosecuting attorney. So the, the paraclete in John is broad, isn't it? It's not, it's not restrictive. We have a broad, a broad understanding 
of, uh, of the paraclete. The Spirit, the Spirit is given to, to glorify Jesus. That's his particular role. So, just, just a word here, a word about systematic theology for a moment. And that is, there are people out there arguing, Amos Young, Clark Pinnock, and others, that the Spirit conveys salvation to people who have never heard of the Son. Are you familiar with these arguments? That the Spirit is working in such a way that salvation is given to people who've never heard of Jesus. But I hope you see, even though we're going fast, that is so contrary to John and the rest of the New Testament because the Spirit is given and distributed when Jesus is exalted. And the Spirit was given to glorify Jesus. The Spirit does not work in saving ways apart from the knowledge of and the preaching of Jesus Christ. It's a, so that's a very, I mean, it's attractive to people, right? That people can be saved without hearing about Jesus. But there's no biblical theological warrant for splitting the spirit from Jesus like that. The, John doesn't specifically say, well, you have to hear about Jesus to be saved. I think other passages do say that. But clearly that's the whole fabric of what he's saying, isn't it? That the, that the spirit and the son work together. So there's no biblical theological warrant for moving in such a direction. Well, what about, what about that passage where Jesus says, uh, receive the Holy Spirit and he breathes on them? What is that? How do we interpret that? That's a very controversial passage. We won't spend much time on it, but some people think that's the Johannine Pentecost. Um, since John, John doesn't talk about the Pentecost, that he, that he talks about the, the, the Pentecost, symbolic, Pentecost symbolically here. Others think this is when the disciples were converted. I don't hold to either of those views. I don't think either of those views persuades. I would argue, along with Don Carson in his John commentary, that this is an anticipation this is an anticipation, a symbolic anticipation of the reception of the Spirit on Pentecost. I think there's problems with it being the Johannine Pentecost. Thomas isn't there. Secondly, right afterwards, I mean, and, uh, the right, yeah, right afterwards they go fishing. They don't, Peter, Peter, hasn't, been, Peter hasn't been restored yet. I think those are all problems with it being the, that suddenly they're clothed with power on that occasion. In terms of their conversion, I think they were already converted. They already believed Jesus was the Messiah. I think they were converted during his ministry. They were believers. So, you know, because that's usually used by Pentecostals or Charismatics to argue for Pentecost being some kind of second blessing. So, all right. Anything you want to say on John will... Hold it, and I'll let you ask a question soon. The other thing I, we ought to notice in John is when it comes to the passion story, he very much emphasizes, he very much emphasizes divine sovereignty. Everything, everything is predestined. Jesus, I already talked about this. Jesus knew what was about to happen. He volunteers himself to his captors. Jesus says, shall I not drink the Father's cup, which is wrath, right? Am I, isn't that what I'm here to do? During the trial, Pilate, Pilate starts by interrogating Jesus, but it turns around and Jesus starts interrogating Pilate. I love that theme, right? Who's on trial here? You know, but it flips. By the way, the same thing happens when Peter is on trial. In, in Acts 4, one of my favorite passages Peter starts out by saying, so are we on trial? Let me understand here. The charges are that we healed somebody that was sick. That, that's the charge. Guilty. We did do that. Put us away. Pilate, Jesus says, you have no authority over me. Jesus says that it's finished. So a real sense of God's in control in John. Right? Everything that's happening is appointed by God. 
and, and prophecy is fulfilled. Same kind of themes, right? God's working out his purposes. This is, these are the most important days in history or day in history. So every, every, so John, it's interesting, John's use of the Old Testament, he really zeroes in, doesn't he, when it comes to Jesus' death. Every little detail, no broken bones, he was pierced. If we think about it, the, 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 the details. So everything's working out according to the way God planned it. And we see this in the other Gospels as well, irony. Jesus is crowned as king. He is the king. <laughs> if you only had eyes to see. He's the crucified king. Yes, yes, yes. He says, behold the man. Yes, he's the man who's king. So you want to read that at two levels. They're mocking him, but John is saying, oh, it's so true. He's the crucified king. Behold your king. We have no king but Caesar. Yes, he, Pilate's speaking God's word to him. Isn't that amazing? Pilate's not serious, is he? He doesn't really mean it. He's mocking them. Here's your king. But John wants you to say, yes, he's so right. As he spoke through Caiaphas, now he's speaking through Pilate. And the Jews say, we have no king but Caesar. They're not serious. Actually, they are. <laughs> Caesar is our king, right? And of course, you see it in the inscriptions. This is the king of the Jews. Pilate doesn't mean it, but it's the truth. So there's irony going on here. God's working. Uh, and of course, the narrative emphasizes the narrative em emphasizes the um, injustice of the verdict. All the gospel writers emphasize that. Of course, the resurrection, very powerful theme. We'll talk about um, we'll talk about John's epistles a little bit. Um, just really flying here, but so First John is written to a situation where we have secessionists, right? If you know the Civil War, the the South in our in the United States, you're not all from the United States, right? The South seceded from the North, and I agree. Many scholars say the opponents in First John they seceded from the church, they left it. They're, they're secessionists. They they established a rival church. And they said, we're the true church. You guys who are left, we, we are, we are, we're sinless. We're, we're perfect as Christians. We're the true people of God. That's what they said. You, you guys are wrong. And John writes to assure those who stayed, right? No, you're really Christians. You're really the Christians. They're wrong. That group that left, they're not true Christians. So what was from the beginning, that's the message and the person, Right? Very much like 1 John, what we have heard, what we've seen with our eyes, what we observe, have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. What is John saying there? Our, our message, we're not Buddhists, right? We're not Hindus. We believe in a historical message. History matters. You can, be, you can be a Buddhist and, not, and believe Buddhist, Buddha never existed. They don't worship Buddha, right? You can believe, be a Hindu. It doesn't matter what happened in history. It's irrelevant. But John says, as an apostle, John's writing, what we've heard in history, right? What we've seen, what we've observed and touched. So I could be yelling out in the hall there. You don't see me, but you hear me. I walk in the room, and then you see me. And then if you touch me, right, every, every step he gets closer, right? Hearing, seeing, touching, the historical actuality of the revelation. Very important to John. It's about the word of life. That life was revealed or manifested in history, in history. Because, right, these opponents deny, they deny that the historical Jesus is the Christ. They're docetists. They hold a docetism, don't they? And so John says, we have seen. The we is John here. And the we apostles have seen. This is written in the 90s. They didn't, the people he's writing to didn't see it. We have seen and we testify and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was manifested and revealed to us. Now, by the way, did you fall asleep for a minute? Let's go over it again. What we've seen and heard, we also declare to you that you may have fellowship with us, us apostles, What's John doing right from the beginning of the letter? If you, 
If you want to have fellowship with God, right, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ, if you want to have fellowship with God, you have to have fellowship with us apostles. And this deviant group that's gone up, they don't have fellowship with us anymore. They don't belong to God. They're not God's children. Fellowship means salvation here, doesn't it? A lot of, a lot of evangelicals say, oh, I'm, I'm not walking in fellowship with God. Well, you could just say to them, oh, I'm sorry to hear you're not saved. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. Don't say that to me. But they don't understand what the word fellowship means. The word fellowship means partnership. That's what it means to be a Christian, to have fellowship with God. So to have partnership, to participate with him. So John's saying, these people who have left, they're not having fellowship with, with we apostles. I think John's the only one left, but he's speaking for the whole apostolic circle. When they don't have fellowship with us, they don't have fellowship with God. So that's a very important point when John starts his letter. What does John say? John says, I'm going to tell you something really amazing about God. What is it? God is light. A little bit surprising because it's not that hard to understand, but it's fundamental, isn't it? God is holy. God is holy. There's no, God is good. God is completely good. And, and God is love. Of course, you can't reverse that. Light isn't God and love isn't God. The, the false teachers, the secessionists claim to be without sin. They claim to be perfect. I think from 1 John 1.10, that's a perfect tense verb, I think they claim to be perfect since their conversion. I think the secessionists argued, look, once you're saved, you can't sin. And you don't sin. You're perfect. And I think they argued, given the rest of the book, actually they sinned a lot. They just gave themselves to sin. And they said, look, Christians can't sin. Everything we do is right. Kind of a strange view, right? Everything we do is right. So we can't sin. And John clearly argues, look, they don't walk in the light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus' his son cleanses us from all sin. So you're not a, you're not a believer, he says. You don't, you don't really have fellowship with God if you're not walking in the light. But walking in the light isn't the same as perfection. How do we know that? Because his blood, as we're walking in the light, cleanses us from all sin. <laughs> isn't that interesting? If it's cleansing us from sin, there must be some sin in those who are walking in the light. Of course. Because we're not perfect, verse 8. These guys claim to be perfect. So uh, what does John mean when he says, no one who is born of God sins? Is he talking about really special, super-duper Christians, right? No, how come that doesn't work? Because he says, no one who is born of God sins. <laughs> that can't be elite Christians. No, born of God refers to who's a Christian, right? Is it... So I'm thinking he's talking about the sin unto death, but I don't think that's clear. Augustine said, we don't sin as long as we're abiding. But I think all these expressions go together. He says, no, that's true of everyone who's born of God. I think the best answer is he's speaking of the characteristic of one's life. No one who's born of God characteristically sins. Is that based on the present tense? Maybe. There's a lot of discussion today on how to interpret Greek verb tenses. We don't have to rely on the verb tenses anyway, since that's a matter of great dispute today, how to interpret those tenses. So, a la Stan Porter. You know, if you're following that stuff on verbal aspect, it's just that discussion is, you know, really going right now. But, but we can just put John's two statements together. Those who are born of God don't sin. If you claim to be without sin, you're a liar. He must be talking about the characteristic and pattern of your life. So John says, the evidence that you're really a believer, and he's writing this to assure the people, not threaten them, although we can apply this to threaten people as well, right? But he says, the evidence that you're really a believer is you're confessing sin, you're keeping the commandments, you're loving the brothers and sisters. You don't love the world. You confess Jesus as the Christ who's come in the flesh, so forth and so on. I like, I like what Francis Schaeffer said. Schaeffer said our obedience is substantial, significant, and observable. 
but not perfect. I think that's what John is saying, substantial obedience. We're changed. We're different people, right? It's significant, and it's noticeable. We always have to be careful, don't we? We have to be careful about pronouncing too quickly over a person's fate. Many, maybe, maybe some of you suffered from this. People come from different kinds of families. Some people come from very dysfunctional families today, more and more people. And that's a very difficult thing to work with. Some, people, some non-Christians come from really relatively healthy families, right? Even a Christian family, we have Christian families in our church that are, you know, a little bit borderline where they're struggling, right? That can happen. So, so we don't want to be simplistic. What I'm saying is C.S. Lewis talks about that really crabby Christian that everybody's like, he's hard to be around. But Lewis says maybe he's grown a lot because maybe before he was even crabbier. You don't see how far he's come in his crabbiness. You just still see that he's crabby. Whereas that person who's really nice, maybe they haven't grown that much at all because maybe they were pretty nice already. <laughs> So we can't judge at the end of the day how far a person's come. As long as that crabby person is confessing their sins and seeking the Lord, but they may say sharp things to you, right? So um, we recognize they're, they're still making progress. And then again, we see once again uh, this emphasis on divine sovereignty. This is the last thing I'm going to talk about with John. Um, I want to say here that John, there's a big debate going on, does regeneration precede faith? I don't know if you're familiar with that debate, but I think John answers it for us. He says, the one who practices righteousness has been born of God. Everyone who has been born of God does not practice sin. Everyone who loves has been born of God. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. So what comes first? First, we practice righteousness, and then we're born of God. Heresy, right? Um, no, no, first we don't practice sin, and then we're born of God because we don't practice sin. Nope, heresy, <laughs> right? Uh, first we love, and then we're born of God because we're so loving. Heresy, right? Actually, born of God in every one of these cases is a perfect tense verb, right? We have present tense, participles. And then, perfect tense verbs. Clearly, every evangelical believes, first we're born of God, then we practice righteousness, right? First we're born of God, then we don't practice sin in our lives. First we're born of God, and then we love. Ah, oh, but then first we're born of God, and then we believe. Regeneration precedes faith. I had one person who was really, he was very, really very evangelical, and he wanted to preserve the idea that faith precedes regeneration, son. So he said to me, yeah, yes, 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 that's all true. But the first time we believe, we do it. And then after that, it's a consequence of being born of God. <laughs> I said, OK, the first time we practice righteousness, we do it. But after that, it's from God. The first time we really are starting out practicing sin, we do that. Then after that, it's from God. The first time we love, that's us. Then after that, we're born of God. Obviously not. Special pleading, right? Special pleading all the way, trying to defend your doctrine at that point in a way that's kind of artificial, a little bit strange. So um, I think it's pretty clear. OK, well, I said a lot of things about John. You can ask anything. Obviously, we race through. There's so much to say about John, right? You can have whole classes on 1 John and the gospel. Anything you want to say? Questions? Yeah. Uh, the cleansing of the temple, do you think that's a different cleansing than in the synoptics, or does John kind of change the order? I think it's a different one. Yeah, I hold to, I think there's indications in the text. Um, I have colleagues I teach with who think that's crazy, that I think there's two cleansings. But I'm unrepentant, you know? I think, I think the most natural way to read it is there were two cleansings, yeah. Anything else you want to say? Yeah. Yeah, regarding the breathing on the disciples, um, I'm just curious. It seems like it's the same uh, event 
that leads to court in chapter 24, where uh, he appears to them and talks to them, and I mean, even what he says is really complimentary to what John records in terms of forgiveness and giving and, and withholding. Um, any chance that when John says he breathed on them, uh, he's saying what Luke says, when Luke says he, their minds were open, he opened their minds to understand, what's he say, to open? To understand the scriptures? To understand the scriptures. Um, just I don't, I don't, I mean, I, I'm honestly, I haven't thought that much about whether it's the same event. I haven't, that, that's just something I haven't considered, but I, I still, of course, different authors look at different things that, even if it is the same event, different things that happened on the same occasion. And I don't, I just don't think it's the same because it's the, the reception of the spirit that he's talking about. And then he says, you know, you'll be able to forgive the sins of others uh, as representatives of Christ. So, I mean, it's a very tough passage, right? <clears throat> The Spirit's work of convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Can you just explain that a little bit for us? And is there a difference between believers and non-believers? Yeah, yes. I, I, I understand the conviction regarding sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then you can come back to me if you want me to say more. I understand that the word world to be the world without distinction not every person without exception. So I understand that conviction to be effective. In other words, some people interpret that passage to say, the spirit convicts everyone, but not everyone comes to faith, right? Everyone's convicted by the spirit of their sin, but some of those convicted refuse to believe. But I think John's saying, Jesus is saying, no, the Spirit convicts effectively. He will show some in the world their sin and uh, their need to believe, their lack of righteousness. He'll show them that Satan is judged. So, the, you know, the other view is, uh, which I think is just antecedently not true. I think it's hard to understand what the other view is saying because you think, I mean, I think of an unbeliever in my family. Does my, is, has, my, um, has my brother been convicted, my oldest brother, has he been convicted that the ruler of this world is judged? I don't think so. I don't think he has any understanding of that whatsoever. So my argument is when you become a believer, Jesus, convict, he convinces you of these things. That's what convict means. He convinces you, yes, you're a sinner. He convinces you there's a judgment. And uh, it brings you to faith. So I think he's talking about the effective work of the Spirit there. Yeah. yeah. So with the uh, First John one seven uh, being, or sorry, First John three nine being characteristic. Yeah. Would would those who um, are looking at what you're doing on the priority of grace um, just say that these are characteristic? Um, so, like, the one who practices righteousness has been born of God. You know, the one who's been born of God has not practiced sin. Can, can they say, you know, we think these are characteristics, just like in the first John 3, 6, 9, Yeah, and I'm happy to say I agree. But they're characteristic because you've been born of God. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. I don't, I don't think he's talking about perfection. Right. You know, you pr don't practice sin. Yeah, that's characteristic. But Why? Because first you've been born of God. So uh, actually, I would agree with that. I'm not, because uh, I don't think we perfectly don't practice sin. So, or we perfectly love. But it's a char the characteristic of our life. Even our, our faith isn't perfect in this life, is it? So, but our, the faith we have, the righteousness we have, the love we have is because we've been born of God. So, so why do, uh, I think uh, maybe Sam Storms and some others who are, you know, in the, camp of, like, you know, Calvinists uh, <coughs> kind of argue against the idea of the preceding grace in these passages. Well, I'd be surprised if Sam does. You think Sam does? Yeah, so. Really? Yeah. Sam Storm? Yeah. <laughs> wow, that would shock me. Sam's a very good friend of mine, and Sam is, you know, Sam is so close with John Piper, for example, and John's written a whole book on this. 
Oh, I don't know, because I have to ask Sam. I have not seen Sam write on this. Um, you know, the people I know who hold this view are people like Gordon Lewis of Denver Seminary. Um, who else has written on this? I think Millard Erickson maybe holds this view. But Sam, Sam, if, if it's Sam, I'm shocked. <laughs> wow. Well, you can check with him. I'm curious. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sure yeah, it might be. It might be. I mean, I, I haven't read everything Sam's done, but that, that would surprise me. So I'm trying to think of what... I can, honestly, I don't remember what they'd say in particular as sc scholars. You know, sometimes when they're doing this in systematic theology, they don't, they don't cover all the verses. <laughs> so they don't get to them all. But I don't remember what they'd say about these verses in particular. I've never heard, I mean, I've published this, and, and I've not heard or read any response to what I've said. So I haven't seen anybody respond to it. Probably there are responses out there. And maybe some of you have seen it somewhere, responses. So, but I don't, I haven't seen it. You know, people don't always send me their responses and find out later. <clears throat> Sam. Now, I know we're not saying Sam. Wow, that'd be amazing to me. I'm just, I'll just put Sam in the room alone with Piper. He'll come out okay. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> you know, uh, as, uh, I, I don't think Piper's always right on everything, of course, but. Uh, when we were at Bethlehem Baptist, we used to say, you know, John can make the phone book interesting. He really can. He can talk to you about the phone book, and it sounds fascinating. 